Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to design tutorial for a 24 volt AC to DC power supply for HVAC applications. And this will be part one in a two part series. And I recently did some designs for a large HVAC system and for buildings or industrial applications. And for those of you who don't know, 24 volt AC is a fairly common voltage level for HVAC applications and other industrial environment applications. But what I found was I really wanted to use a design off the shelf for the power supply, but there really wasn't many options, especially for what fit my requirements. So I thought maybe I'm not the only one and I'll do a tutorial on this. And this is really going to talk a lot about just a DC to DC converter design. So if that's something you're looking into, this will also be very useful. Go to Forstronics.com if you want information on Forstronics for pay engineering services and uh, subscribe to Forstronics YouTube channel if you haven't already. All right, before I get into the technical design goals, I'll say that another caveat here is I'm not a power electronics expert, and this tutorial is made for people who are not power electronics design experts. You know, the idea here is we're gonna look at a way where we don't have to do tough uh, component calculations for a DC to DC converter design. You don't need expensive cadence software for you know simulating your design so this is supposed to be for those of us who do not special in the power electronics like me some of the technical design goals for this design was it needed to be handle handle 24 volts ac rms and because industrial environments and hvac environments that use 24 volts ac they're often noisy unaccurate environments so it needs to be able to handle 30 volts AC max, and actually I'm gonna over design it to handle much more than that. And the design needed to handle DC as well, and I wanted to handle up to 48 volts DC. So this power supply is gonna take either 24 volts AC or 48 volts DC, as well as a range down to 24 volts DC as well. I had two different designs, but I had to have one for 10 volts output DC and 12 volts DC output. And so this design will be nice because it you can adjust the output voltage. It's made for rugged, noisy electrical environments. So we're gonna have some protection features on it. I also needed a small form factor and I needed a fairly low noise output. DC to DC converter designs can be noisy, but we needed fairly low noise output because my design used analog transducers as well as it outputted analog signals. And the goal here is to have a two-part series. It, it is possible it could spill into three, but let's try to target two parts. And this first part, I'm gonna talk about the overview of the design, some of the basics of a DC to DC buck converter, the design choices and why I made them, as well as I'll share the bill of materials. And then I'll talk briefly about the PCB layout, but in part two, I'll get more into PCB layout. For DC to DC converter designs, PCB layout is important. And then we'll also do some testing and demonstrations in part two. Okay, I'm assuming the, the listener here has a basic understanding of a DC to DC converter, especially a DC to DC buck converter. If you don't, I would encourage you to just do a search on the internet. That way you can get the basics down before we go forward. But the idea is a DC to DC converter, unlike a linear regulator, is gonna take an input, DC input, chop it up into a pulse width modulated signal, and then smooth out that signal into a DC level. And I have a, you know, a basic design here. And the idea is the duty cycle of the pulse width modulated signal changes based on the load's response. So it's trying to maintain a constant voltage, but the load's current can change, and that will vary the duty cycle of the DC to DC, excuse me, of the PWM signal. Now this flywheel circuit is critical because this is what's gonna take our PWM signal and smooth it out into a DC signal. And the idea is the, the switching transistor acts like a switch. And so when it's on, this is like a short and this diode, excuse me, not diode, this inductor is gonna build up a magnetic field. And when the switch is open, this diode allows current to flow. So the, the fields of the inductor can discharge, as well as you have your energy reservoir capacitor to smooth out that in input, excuse me, smooth out the output. Why not use a linear regulator? Linear regulators are very easy to design with, they're cheap, 
and they have nice clean outputs. But the problem is, is they can't handle a large voltage drop across them, right? Because they're not efficient. They generate a lot of heat. So I, in my designs, I use linear regulators downstream, but to handle this input and output voltage across this uh, power supply design, a linear regulator would just get too hot. And once again, I'm just showing the DC portion of this. Of course, we're gonna have AC on the input, so we need to convert that AC to a raw DC. We also are gonna have some protection features, and we're also gonna have some noise elimination features. And for the, the heart of the design, the buck converter, I'm gonna use Texas Instruments LM46000. TI or Texas Instruments, they make great power ICs, and that's why I went with them. They make high quality, dependable products that are well documented, and they, they're not paying me to say that. I do love their products on the power side. So why did I choose the LM46000? Well, I said I wanted this device to be rugged. I, didn't want, I want it to be rugged, reliable, and not break easy. So this can handle input voltages up to 60 volts DC. Also, the output is adjustable. We can set it by these two resistors that form a voltage divider for the feedback pin on the IC. I wanted a small form factor. TI, and I think this is a patented uh, package they have, but they have this power pad or this thermal pad on the bottom of a lot of their power ICs. And this is just a, a metal pad that can connect directly to the uh, PCB and provides a nice, you know, low resistance ground connection and also a thermal connection to dissipate heat. And that, what, that's what allows them to make the package so small for handling large voltages or larger currents and things like that. TI's products are pretty high quality, so I knew it would be fairly low noise. And you can see the package down here. I've already talked about it. This is the simplified schematic. And just to relate it to the, the basic circuit we just saw, you know, here's our flywheel circuit. Here's the inductor and the output capacitor. You don't see the diode because TI integrates the diode inside the IC, so the diode is there. Then, of course, we have some other components for biasing and the feedback loop and things like that. So let's get into the, the actual design. So here's the schematic. Here we have our LM46000. You know, we have our flywheel circuit and some of our feedback elements. But we also need to handle the input AC. We have some protection on the input and we have some noise reduction on the output. Before I get into the input and the output, let's talk more about the DC to DC converter design. So a lot of these components are you know, part of what makes the DC to DC converter design work. You know, A big thing here is the, the power inductor. We have our output capacitors and we have our input capacitor as well as our feedback and biasing elements. And you might say, where did you come up with all these values of these components? And not only the values of the components, but what's really critical when working with DC to DC converters is you have to dig into specs for inductors and capacitors that for a lot of other designs, you don't have to worry about. But DC to DC converters can be very sensitive about parasitic elements, things like series resistance and capacitors, all that is critical when putting a DC to DC converter design together. So to do it properly, we really need to dig into the documentation for the DC to DC converter. Here we're looking at the LM46000 data sheet. And I know some people cringe when they see a data sheet, but you know this is just meant to be a, I don't know, 15 or 20 minute tutorial. But if you're really gonna you know, design something, this tutorial will help you get started, but you really still need to read the data sheet. You know, every IC that I work with, especially if it's a new IC, I read the data sheet. And I have, I've had people tell me, oh, I don't read data sheets, I don't understand them. And that's fine, but you really need to read it. And if you don't understand it, you know, use the web to do the research on parts you don't understand. If you can't find it on the web, use the support community for the manufacturer. They'll have forums, you know, write your question in the forum. Sometimes company experts or just expert users monitor those forums and they provide great answers. So, you know, if you're just a hobbyist starting out or a young engineer, you really still need to learn how to read the data sheet and what it means. So that's just my little tip. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on the data sheet here. I'm going to show you a way to do things a little quicker, but you still always read the data sheet. So I'm going to jump to page 16 on the data sheet because I want to talk about you know, where I'm getting some of these values for the components. 
and the data sheet will provide in detail you know the components you need the values you need and how to come up with those values based on how you're configuring the dc to dc converter the data sheet and we'll also come back to this in part two, also provides guidance on layout. PCB layout is critical for DC to DC converters, especially as you go up in their switching frequency. Now here we're looking at how to set the output voltage. And I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but you can see they have a formula, they give you tips on the resistor values to use. And so this is how you're gonna set your output voltage. And as we go through this, we can see other information on other components and a lot, sometimes they require calculations and considerations. What's nice though, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm glad I chose a TI chip is they actually give you a nice shortcut for getting to what you need in your circuit for your DC to DC converter. And to do that, we're gonna look at their, let me switch to the schematic view. To do that, we're gonna look at their online or browser tool called WebBench Power Designer. So just search, you know, TI WebBench Power Designer, or you actually can find a link to it in the data sheet we were just at. And this simplifies the process of choosing your components and understanding your component values. It also will help you with PCB layout, which we'll talk about more in the um, part two. Now, once again, you still need to read the data sheet, but this is a great tool to get you going. And so what you do here, and I'm not gonna give a full tutorial on the tool, it's pretty easy to use, but you specify how you plan to use the DC to DC converter within its specs, right? So I need an output of 10 volts. Its max current is 0.5 amps, so I chose that as my output current. Actually, my design doesn't use that current that high, but once again, I wanted this design to be rugged. The input I specified from 30 volts to 50 volts. If you remember, I wanna use it up to 48 volts DC and I just want it to be rugged. So I, I chose a fairly high ceiling for my voltage range. And so once you start to enter these values, TI will generate this schematic and this schematic will actually give you the values for, for your different components that they define that's needed for the chip. So for instance, here's our inductor, here's our output capacitance, here's our resistors that set the output voltage. So this is what I use, one mega ohm, 113 kilo ohms, your bias capacitor, and it'll give you the bill of materials, the parts it recommends. I already mentioned the PCB layout, but you don't have to use these parts, but this is always the great starting point. And I've changed some of these. Like for instance, they recommended for my output capacitance that I use four, uh, and I think I can click on these. Uh, there we go. They wanted me to use four 10 microfarad caps, uh, electrolytic caps. And because I wanted a small form factor and I also wanted low noise, I went with three ceramic 22 microfarad caps. And look, they give you an option to choose alternatives. But what my recommendation for you is, is because they are very sensitive, DC to DC converters, especially at higher switching frequencies, to the components they use and some of the, you know, some of the, the, the aspects of the components that may be buried deep in their data sheet, I always like to start out with the components that they recommend, the higher quality components. Then, if I find my bill of material cost is a little high or the components are a little bulky, that's when I'll then try different components to optimize, whether for lower cost, you know, lower noise, or things like that. But I always like to start with the bill of materials that they recommend as a good starting point. That way I'm not guessing if I go with a cheaper component, where did, you know, what am I sacrificing? I can play around with it. Once I get the device working with the ideal components, I can play around with values and lower components or lower quality components to reduce cost, you know, have lower output noise, so on and so forth. So once again, I just wanted to show this tool. It's a great tool. It even has simulation options, things like that. I'm not gonna go into a ton of it, but you can further optimize after you have, you know, the, the ideal components. Okay, let's get more into this schematic now that we talked about the, you know, the the flywheel design and the basic DC to DC converter design. And I'm not gonna go through each component and tell you exactly what it does. You know, you can find that in the data sheet. 
But if we start at the beginning, here's where we how we handle our AC, right? So we're gonna use a half wave rectifier. And I did that for size constraints, you know, try to keep this, I wanna have a small footprint, small form factor for the power supply. Half wave rectifiers are not very efficient, but then again, this is not high power and you know, it's not a battery application, so I wasn't worried about that. But basically I use a Schottky diode and Schottky diode is a diode that has a low voltage drop to basically take my AC signal and chop off the negative part of it. So I just get these half wave positive humps. And then I threw in a large capacitor value to help me smooth these out. So we get this sort of pulsating DC and I'll show examples in part two of what this looks like. And then we even have another ceramic, big bulky 10 microfarads cap that's part that's required for the DC to DC converter. So we, we smooth out our rectified AC pretty well. I also have a Zener diode, and this is part of, you know, remember I said I want this design to be rugged. Well, this is a 60 volt Zener diode, so that if someone applies too much voltage, you know, this will turn on and help protect the chip. For my input caps, I always size caps at hot, much higher voltage levels, a lot of margin because caps in power supplies tend to be the most unreliable component, especially some of the cans. So I, I don't remember exactly what values I have here, but I always choose them. I think, I think they're actually close to 100 volts. A lot of margin in caps because we don't want it to break. Then as we go towards the output, to help lower the, the noise, I added more capacitance on the output than the design recommended. And that's, that's something you can do to help reduce noise I've even seen people when they're prototyping, they'll get caps, ceramic caps, and stack them on top of each other uh, on their you know, prototype PCB just to see if it further reduces the noise. Then I have this FB1 is a ferrite bead. And a ferrite bead is sort of its own component. It, you know, A lot of people like to think of it in, as an inductor, which it kind of is, but it's almost like a little filter. And the idea here is it lets a certain frequency range pass, you know, as if it was a short, but once you get up into the higher frequencies, it will then start to attenuate those values. And so it's meant to try to clean out some of that higher frequency noise. It's not going to clean out low frequency noise, but higher frequency noise. And then adding a cap on the output of your ferrite bead actually helps increase its filtering capabilities. And I'm not gonna to go too much in it. There's a great uh, analog devices tutorial on using ferrite beads. So I'll provide a link to that in my disc video description if you wanna check that out for more information. Okay, that's, that's it for the basic overview of the, the layout, the schematic of the design. Here is the bomb. And we'll go into, well, we won't go into this in more detail, but I just wanted to put this out there. You know, you can take a screen capture of it. You know, some of these components are fairly basic because I played around and figured out, okay, this, you know, I don't, this 470 nanofarad cap doesn't have to be something that's very expensive. Uh, this 62 picofarad cap, uh, actually I've noticed now that, that a lot of the distributors that I use are out of it. So I've actually used a 68 picofarad cap and I, the performance was, was pretty much identical. Uh, the 100 nanofarad cap or the 10 nanofarad cap was the filter cap at the output of the ferrite bead. Once again, read that app note if you want more information on choosing the right value there. Okay, and that's about it for part one. In part two, we'll get into the PCB layout, and PCB layout is important. You know, you're gonna have multiple ground planes in the PCB layout. You have to worry about thermals, you have to worry about low inductance, things like that. And then in part two, we'll also do some testing, and we'll kind of see what the output looks like, but we'll also see some intermediate signals and what they look like and talking about, you know, how, why they look like that based on the circuit flow. All right, if you have any questions, please use the comment section. And once again, I can only cover so much in a video. So if you have, if there's something I missed or something you think needs to be built on, please put that in the comment section for the other, other watchers and listeners. Thank you for watching.